May he have dominion from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. May all kings fall down before him. All nations serve him. Welcome back to the Dominion Podcast, Season 2. We uh, we got a great episode for you guys tonight. Yeah, yeah. we got a great, a great one. It's right. going to be great. My name is uh, Jeremy Boyd, one of your hosts. I'm Alex Klusterman. And uh, we are brought to you by the Upper 40 Studio, Upper40.com, official sponsors. Do you guys notice this wall behind us? Look at this thing. That's him. Would you just look at it? Just look at it. I mean, look at it. Just have a look. When I when I first walked in here, I just said to myself, would you just look at it? I mean, look. I mean, just look at it. <laughs> There's a jackalope. There's some guns. Did you look at it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm looking at it. <laughs> in a, in a uh, little red end sign. Tristan got all this wood. This was this is only like five bucks worth of wood. He just scored a giant bundle of wood and uh, decided he would do something really nice for the studio. So thanks, Tristan. Thanks. Bob. Awesome. We're so privileged to be up here. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> anyway, we just want to introduce tonight's episode. We uh, just recorded a, a, an interview with Dr. Stephen Wellam from Southern Seminary in Louisville, Louisville, Kentucky. I got corrected on my pronunciation of Louisville. And um, I'll, I guess I'll let you sort of introduce why we wanted to talk to him. Yeah. And then we can sort of shoot yeah, the breeze so for a couple minutes. We're doing a series on Christ and the nations. And we want to think through what is the relationship between the Lord Jesus Christ and the nations? What is his relationship to Canada? What is his relationship to our government? What is his relationship over the citizens of this nation? And there are conversations happening right now, which are good. Um, some of them are producing more heat than light, and I just thought um, we need to establish fundamental biblical categories when we are in times of controversy. Mm-hmm. And the in order to understand any area of theology properly, you need to have the story of Scripture right. And so, Dr. Stephen Wellam has done a lot of work on the story of Scripture, particularly as it unfolds through the biblical covenants. And ultimately, this is how we understand the identity and the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, there's there's nothing in one sense more fundamental to this. Yeah. And so, I thought, okay, before we get into the weeds of how do we, you know, apply the Word of God to every sphere of life, um, I want to make the case that we ought to be doing that, yeah. right? Because that, that is a point of dispute. We need to agree on this first principle before yes. we move forward. So, we, we wanted to have a mind to establish first principles, and I think... You know, you you just summed up our our conversation perfectly. What was it that you just said when we ended? Uh, I think it was something along the lines of uh, <laughs> Jesus made everything; he gets to make the rules. Yes, that that's a it's it's an it's an it's, it should be uncontroversial. Yeah, and I found this this was very helpful for me. And and I've said this; I think I even said it in the interview that the talk talk of covenants often makes my head spin mm-hmm. when you hear all the different debates between pedo baptism pedo communion all this mm-hmm. stuff it makes my head spin but the way he presented everything and i'm not saying he's a pedo baptist mm-hmm. he's not he's a regular baptist um a proper baptist. he's a, a proper baptist yes biblical baptist <laughs> um but he he laid it out so clearly that when he was done his introduction I was like okay i think i've that's that's the most clear it's ever been to me yeah so. so we hope you guys enjoy it. We hope it brings clarity um, as you get to understand God's word and how it unfolds and ultimately what it means that Jesus Christ is Lord. Yeah. So without any further ado, I guess we'll uh, get over to that. So enjoy the interview. All right. All right. Well, we are joined this evening by Dr. Stephen Wellam. And he is a professor of Christian theology at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. I don't know if I said that right. (laughs) You said it correct. And uh, he is the editor of the Southern Baptist Journal of Theology. He and his wife, Karen, have five adult children. He is also the author of multiple books. And this is how I was first introduced to um, Stephen's works, including Kingdom Through Covenant, two editions, which he co-authored with Peter Gentry. God the Son Incarnate, a work on Christology, and The Person of Christ, a smaller uh, work on Christology, and and a bunch of others. And uh, we also have mutual friends, friends of his family as well. And Dr. Wellam has done a lot of thinking and writing about the nature of the biblical covenants 
and the identity of Jesus Christ and how those two things relate to one another. And these two areas of theology, we'll hopefully get into this, are really fundamental to all other discussions of theology. How you understand the covenants, their relationship to one another, really you know, impacts how you understand the nature and the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that impacts everything. So as, as, as we were thinking through talking about Christ and the nations, we thought we would begin with a biblical and systematic basis and thought it'd be great to ask Stephen to come on, and he thankfully said yes. So thank you for joining us. It's a great privilege to be with you and uh, talking to you from the United States to Canada. So yes, yeah, I gave up on Zoom. We we did the we were on Zoom the first lockdown, and I had to do a lot of Zoom stuff. And I honestly, I think I quit it for like at least a year and a half after. Yeah. I was I was triggered every time I had to look at a, a camera. But um, once you've preached sermons to a camera, you never want to do it again. Yeah. So, well, so, and 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 in, in truth, you shouldn't be doing it either, should you? Oh no, exactly. I had, I had to repent of that because <laughs> the camera can't repent. No, and turn to Christ. No, no. so so <laughs> I did repent of that publicly, and and uh, it's hard now to go back. But we are thankful for the opportunity this affords. So, by way of preamble, we wanted to talk about the relationship of Christ and the nations. So, there's a lot of controversy going on in the church right now, especially in the West as we think through the relationship of the church and the state, for example, of the state to its citizens, and ultimately we're thinking about the relationship of Christ to the state and to those outside Mm -hmm. of the church. You know, what authority, if any, does the Lord Jesus Christ have over unbelievers, in particular those in authority? So this has raised a whole host, and this has been very practical, at least in Canada. I'm not sure how um, it was in Kentucky, but we we were, you know, told that we must forsake the gathering of the saints, that we were told um, that we must, you know, forbid people from attending who didn't abide by extra biblical health requirements to attend worship. Uh, you know, pastors faced jail time in Canada. We think about brothers Tim Stevens and James Coates simply for going to church. And so it, it raised questions for Christians that in my lifetime, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm 37, I've, I've never had to answer. It's not that the state has, has, has never been corrupt or tyrannical to any degree, but it's, it didn't come to our front step the way that it did. Right. So the fallout of this is it raised a lot of questions, which are good. Times of controversy can purify the church. It raised questions about the relationship of the state to the church. These things are really questions of authority. But in order to have questions of authority answered, you need to have a theology of authority. And that has to begin with, obviously, the scriptures and the story that they tell. So, I thought this evening we could start just very basically, Dr. Wellam, um, in explaining the significance of the biblical covenants and how they unfold the story of Scripture. And then maybe we could dig deeper into those Mm. places. But if you could begin there. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, the covenants obviously are are crucial. They are, uh, in some sense, how the Bible's storyline unfolds is through those covenants. And the covenants are at their heart, uh, at our relationship with God, right? So, Mm -hmm. I am your God, you are my people. Uh, So, a covenant relationship is what he makes with us as his creatures. And I would say, I mean, typical Reformed covenant theology will speak of the eternal plan of God and then tie that to what's called the covenant of redemption. And that that's, I think, perfectly fine. Mm-hmm. People quibble over whether you call it a covenant or not. But there is obviously an eternal plan. There's a plan between Father, Son, and Spirit in terms of our salvation. And then they speak of the covenant of works that's tied with Adam. So Genesis 1 and 2, and then the covenant of grace that then goes from Genesis 3.15 all the way through the uh, the biblical covenants, and they're put under that larger umbrella. So that's, that's that in terms of their view. Uh, I don't think that's quite right. I mean, mm-hmm. obviously, there's a lot of truth in that. Um, yet, uh, I would say that uh, there is the plan of God tied to the, uh, the covenant of redemption or the pactum salutis, where there's the plan of salvation of Father, Son, and Spirit in terms of their work. And then in history, the outworking of that, we would have something like uh, a covenant of, of works tied to, to Adam and creation. So the importance of creation, the importance of the covenant, uh, 
And then instead of seeing one overarching covenant of grace, I think we have a divine promise, a promise of salvation mm -hmm. that's given in Genesis 3.15 that points to the new covenant. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, the Old Testament covenants that are post-fall redemptive carry forth that promise that will ultimately lead us to the new covenant and the coming of Christ. And then we have to treat each of the biblical covenants in terms of their own location or place in redemptive history and how they interrelate to what is prior to them. So we start with creation, we have the fall, we have then Noah, Abraham, uh, Mosaic covenant, Davidic covenant, new covenant that comes with, with Christ. And they're not isolated from one another, they're all unfolding mm -hmm. the one eternal plan of God that's centered in Christ. And so you have a very strong Christological sense. So in some sense, all Christians agree with that, but then it's getting at the the specifics and, and the details of that. So all the covenant promises ultimately lead us to Christ. He is the one who is last Adam. So you have a very strong relationship between creation mm -hmm. and what happens with Adam and uh, are being made in God's image mm -hmm. and God choosing to graciously enter into a covenant relationship with us the breaking of that covenant and then that which comes now in Christ who brings the promise of salvation. He is the seed of the woman. He is more than just a human. He is the divine son who brings all of God's promises to pass in him. And we see that culminating in, in the new covenant. So that's sort of the broad overview mm -hmm. of how those covenants unfold. And then you have to zero in on the specific covenants. So going into creation, what's going on there? Mm -hmm. How does that relate then to the new covenant? What's mm -hmm. going on with Noah? What's going on with Abraham and so on as you as you work through scripture? And when you do that, then you get some sense of how the plan of God unfolds, what it is. It's revealed to us step by step by step. Mm -hmm. And we also then can make uh, allowances or differences between uh, Israel's covenant with, with uh, Moses, with Israel. That's not going to be exactly the same as the fulfillment that comes in the new covenant, what the mm -hmm. church is. Obviously, there's one people of God through the ages, but we have to then speak of where people are covenantally, what that specific covenant is doing, mm -hmm. and then how does it relate to what now comes in Christ. And then from there, uh, you know, your larger issue of speaking of church, state, nations, uh, lordship of Christ over all of that, that has to be brought in mm -hmm. in terms of creation, fall, what the covenants are doing, what the nations are, when the nations even begin. Mm -hmm. That's a whole debate as to when the nations begin. Are they creation uh, started or are they post-fall? Are they tied to the Tower of Babel mm -hmm. and, and so on? That's a huge debate between uh, Stephen Wolf who's promoting that they are found in creation, which I disagree with. So that that's a sort of a broad overview. And then we can, I'll, I'll, I'll let you pick up from there. I mean, we can then zero in specifically then on, you know, the creation and, 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 and those kind of covenants. But uh, that's sort of a broad overview of how I would see the covenants working. That's helpful. So, so for our listeners, when one of the questions that we should begin with is what do we mean by a covenant? And there's some technical answers to this, you know, um, a solemn ceremony where vows are exchanged, promises are made, this type of thing. But what what I think is helpful when we think about other ethical issues, when we talk about covenants, we're actually trying to define a relationship. That's that's the purpose of a covenant. The, the covenant is to define a relationship in terms of responsibilities or duties and corresponding authority. And it's and it's also Coupled with that are the consequences of either living up to those responsibilities or failing at those responsibilities. In the Bible, those are blessings and curses. So the question that we have, this is a foreign way of thinking for most contemporary Christians, that we don't think covenantally. We don't think, what is what are the inherent obligations and duties that I have to this person or to this institution? Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a bunch of reasons for that. We could think about individualism, you know, secularism in general. When you reject a transcendent God, you reject an objective morality, you reject an objective sense of duty to anyone or anything. Mm -hmm. And then you get where we are, where Truman talks about the expressive individualism. What, what is this talk of duties and responsibilities in a world where you are your own God? The, mm -hmm. it, it means nothing. So, what we're trying to get at is that if you don't understand 
the way that God has covenantally related to his creation and the way that he has defined how we are to relate to one another, you can't live a faithful Christian mm-hmm. life. And so when we talk about the covenants in scripture, we're not, we're not just talking about technicalities. We're talking about very fundamental mm-hmm. and practical questions of, of what is my responsibility? What is, and, and, and they're revelatory as well. Who is God? Who are we? What, what are we supposed to be and do? In that vein, um, why don't we begin with creation? A lot of people have recognized, you've said this before in your works, that a lot of Christians overlook the covenant with creation. They think that Genesis is entirely to do with debates surrounding, you know, views of evolution or something. But there's there's a lot going on here that if we miss the beginning, um, we get we get others wrong. So, what are some some major points, some I guess principles that we take away uh, in the biblical account of creation? Yeah, I mean, creation is is where the Bible begins. Uh, it's it's the, it speaks of the most foundational and fundamental relationship of of God to His creatures. Mm-hmm. Uh, it establishes the creator creature distinction, which is which is the problem we have in our society, right? Yeah. Everyone thinks they're God mm-hmm. uh, when they're just creatures, and uh, so the fundamental relationship of God is God. He is the eternal one. He's the triune God uh, who exists from all eternity and all of His glory, and then He chooses. Uh, to make a world, right? Mm-hmm. So he, he has an eternal plan and he enacts that plan by creating a stage and then bringing about his plan on that stage of human history. So creation is so fundamental. Yes, uh, the creation evolution debates are, 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 are important here as yeah. well, but also a whole doctrine of creation and the historicity of what is going on here as well. If we're mm-hmm. not talking about that, then it's all hanging uh, in midair, but mm-hmm. creation itself establishes who God is. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's mm-hmm. why Paul, when he goes to Athens and speaks to pluralistic contexts, people that have different foreign worldviews, they don't have the Bible. Where does he begin? Right? He begins in creation. The Bible mm-hmm. begins here. Uh, the Bible story goes from creation to new creation, and you got to get the bookends mm-hmm. uh, right, otherwise uh, everything in between uh, falls apart. So it establishes who God is and a mm-hmm. specific kind of God. And so we could go into that in great detail. Yeah. Well, we won't, but I mean, in the sense of a triune God, a self-sufficient God, a God who is sovereign, a God who plans all things, knows all things, who's good, who's holy, who's just, right? So God is the standard, mm-hmm. particularly when you start coming to moral, ethical obligation, yeah. is, is God is the standard of what is right and good mm-hmm. and just. Mm-hmm. So when we speak about God's law, right? Uh, we have to have a certain conception of God. God's law is ultimately the reflection of his will and nature. Mm-hmm. So, uh, uh, you know, the, the definition of the good is not uh, Plato's euphoro or some, right. some abstract form of goodness out there. Mm-hmm. God is the very definition of good. What he wills according to his very being, his very nature, mm-hmm. is what is good, what conforms to that is good. What doesn't conform to that is that which is wrong and sinful. And at the point of, of the doctrine of God is that he is Lord. Mm-hmm. So he is Lord, King, you use King, Lord, yep. he's the creator, uh, that he, uh, that all creation, right? And especially when we think of uh, creatures made in his image, and we could even tie that to angels, but we'll tie it to humans as image bearers. Uh, we owe him everything. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that by creation, right, there is the demand that God makes rightly of perfect conformity to his will and character. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, uh, you know, when we start speaking of the lordship of Christ and uh, the God is king, that starts in the fact of our doctrine of God. It's grounded in creation. Mm-hmm. Uh, all people, whether they acknowledge it or not, are under the lordship of Christ or mm-hmm. under the lordship of God. Mm-hmm. So, so that's a doctrine of God. Uh, then you have humans. So we are made as image bearers, all of that, even the language of image, even the language of likeness is all covenantal language in the ancient Near East. Uh, image was applied to the king, to the gods, yet now it's applied to all of us, which is a glorious truth, mm-hmm. is that all of us are royal. All of us are kings and queens made to rule, made to represent God, mm-hmm. and so on. But we do make at least a logical distinction between being creatures so we're creatures that owe God everything and a covenant relationship. Mm-hmm. God does not have to enter into covenant relationship with us. That's an act mm. 
uh, the Westminster Confession will say, the Second London Baptist will say, it's an act of condescension. Mm-hmm. We we sometimes they're, they're they're avoiding the term grace because they often keep grace in terms of the relation of sin. Mm-hmm. But but it's an act of, of God's goodness, condescension. Mm-hmm. He he made us so that we rightfully are to obey Him. That is our that is our duty. That is our creation to to raise our fist against God is ultimately uh, to to be the rebel and to stand against who God has made us to be. Uh, mm-hmm. We have our very life and breath from him. Mm-hmm. Yet God then chooses to enter into covenant relationship. And what we have that in Genesis 2, that's why the name Lord, Lord God is used in Genesis 2. Elohim is used in Genesis 1, but the covenant name of Yahweh is used in, in Genesis 2 where there's a covenant relationship. And God then uh, condescends to give Adam a command of not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but he can have everything else. And implied in that with the tree of life is, is a promise of life. So that uh, Adam is not earning his favor. His, his due as creature is to give God everything. But God then gives him a promise. He is not created in a final state. We know that from scripture. He's created in a good state, a moral state. But it's not a final state that we have in glorification. And mm-hmm. the covenant is not only the way that we relate to God and our relationship to him, but it's also the means by which uh, we have life. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, we would have eternal life. And right. so obedience to God's command is what we owe mm-hmm. uh, God. But that he then promises impl- implicitly that if there is obedience, there would be life. And so that is the covenant relationship that's established. Adam to speak of Adam in creation is very, very important. He's a, a representative head. Mm-hmm. The head just simply means a, a covenant head. Mm-hmm. So uh, when we get the language of federal, we often talk about federal head. Mm-hmm. Federal just comes from the Latin, which means covenant. So that he is a, he is our representative. He is the first man, but he's also a covenant head. And he is to obey God perfectly by obedience, by giving God his due, by loving him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we would say the great commandment is found in creation as well. Uh, Adam is to love God, and he's also to love his wife, mm-hmm. right? Which is love of God and neighbor. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what that's where it begins. It doesn't begin in Exodus twenty. It begins there in creation and covenant relationship. It's not spelled out there mm-hmm. uh, the way you have it in later scripture, but it's all there. And the great commandment's nothing new. That's what we were made for. Mm-hmm. And uh, Adam is to represent us. He is to obey, and he is to enter into glory by obedience and he disobeys right so that that re- that broken relationship is there so that in the falls we have to clearly distinguish between pre-fall and post-fall the post-fall situation brings curse if sin comes into the world which is a rebellion against god and death right physical death mm-hmm. spiritual death the curse placed upon all of creation god is still lord over everything Yet there is now in the fall opposition to his lordship. It's foolish opposition. It's it's really in scripture stupidity. Mm-hmm. Uh, yet um, we rebel. And of course, you then have in Genesis 3.15, I don't think you have a separate beginning of an entirely different covenant. But you cer- certainly have a post-fall situation, which is different than pre-fall. So that uh, much of what we talk about in terms of law gospel, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, theologically, that makes sense. God has given uh, Adam commands and and, and so on in covenant relationship. Gospel is a promise, a promise of salvation. Genesis 3.15 is that initial promise. And the promise is, is that he will send a seed of the woman, right? He will send a redeemer who will overturn, undo the work of the first man. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so we have already a sense of a greater Adam that must come. And it's going to take a while for that to unfold. But there's a lot of things that, that are creation that are very important. The lordship of God, mm-hmm. the kind of God that he is, the demand that he makes upon creatures, uh, what Adam's role is in terms of covenant relationship, that condescension of God to make a promise, Adam's disobedience that affects all every single person right so every mm. single person this is what we mean by original sin uh sin is transmitted we are guilty we're polluted we're depraved in adam uh and uh, we then raise our fist against god yet god is lord yet in that genesis three fifteen promise there is a sense in which right you and you see this in genesis 4 5 and and so on is that you will have some sense of kingdoms that will result mm. 
Mm. Uh, two kingdoms. Now, two kingdoms, people mean different things by it. What I simply mean by it is, is that God is king over all. He's Lord over all. Mm-hmm. But then there is opposition to it. It's mm-hmm. foolish opposition. Yet God is going to send a redeemer and he's going to call out a people that will acknowledge his rule and reign. Mm-hmm. All people ought to acknowledge it. And he demands, ultimately, he'll hold people accountable mm-hmm. for not acknowledging his rule and reign. But then there will be those whom God transforms uh, so that they will gladly come under the sovereign rule mm-hmm. of God. And of course, you see that through various people. I think Adam's a believing man. He calls his wife Eve post-fall, which, which would makes sense because she's going to be the mother of living, which yeah. is tied to the Genesis 3.15 promise. You have Noah, you have uh, Abram, but you also then have, you know, a distinction between believing people and unbelieving people that occurs in Genesis 3.15 on or Genesis 3 on. And uh, that's going to be very, very important in establishing then nations, the role of the state. The state is under the sovereign rule of God. I would ar- also argue in creation mm-hmm. that uh, the government so I think we need to distinguish nations from uh, sort of a governing rule so right. that uh, – so nations – I don't think you have nations in creation, right? Because we're all part of Adam. We would have multiplied theoretically if if we hadn't sinned. I don't think you would have multiple nations starting. Mm-hmm. Uh, that doesn't seem to start until the Tower of Babel where God spreads languages and then you have – nations that can form due to being isolated and and uh, being separated by by languages and so on but you would have government government would have to be part of the creation mandate to to be fruitful to multiply to rule over the world you'd have to have organization right Mm -hmm. so government in and of itself ruling uh, a division of labor this type of thing uh, governing even among humans would not be something illegitimate yet sin distorts everything right so that uh, government then becomes uh, not what it ought to be mm-hmm. uh, and as well as humans not what they ought to be and so that will work out through the storyline but those are some key areas of creation mm. that are very very significant and then we have to move to Noahic because that now speaks of sort of creation realities in a post-fall situation. Mm-hmm. It's not a, it's not a Genesis one and two situation anymore. So why don't we why don't we pause here to work out some implications from this? Because there's a bunch of things going through my mind. Do you want to yeah. say something? Oh, I just I feel like I'm I'm, I'm going to sound like the dunce in class if I ask questions. You know, I haven't sat under this kind of yeah. teaching. I grew up in a, a very different denomination that never talked about covenants. So. <laughs> I was telling Alex as we've been going talking about this for you know a year now, just kind of going down this road. Like when I when I read, I read your book, the Progressive uh, or Kingdom, Kingdom Through Freedom. Covenant, and it just makes my head swim a lot of the time trying to keep all these categories straight. So I, I mean, as you're speaking, I have questions and I can hardly formulate them. But one of them would be: um, Is God's relationship to His creature through covenant always accompanied by? laws and requirements to his uh, to his creatures and to the creation itself and the, even the material world and if that's so do those do those requirements that god gave adam still apply despite adam's breaking that covenant like uh, what happens from our perspective when a covenant is broken by us what does that do to the yeah, covenant yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I think I think the covenant relationship in in scripture, you know, God is our God, we are His people. He is the He is the God that uh, demands uh, from us uh, love, uh, devotion, obedience, and so on. And and how would we know what that is unless there's actually specific uh, commands that are given? And that's precisely what you see, right? Mm-hmm. So even in even in the garden before the fall, you have both God's creation of the world. We speak of natural revelation, right? We we look at the skies, the heavens declare the glory mm-hmm. of God, but we also have special revelation even before the fall. Adam would have had to hear a word from God mm-hmm. to know what to do, yeah. uh, to know how to carry out his mandate, right? Uh, God always, uh, God's a speaking God, right? And so as he relates to us, um, it's it's good and right that he gives us instructions, knowledge, and so on. So the laws are ultimately tied to um, you know who he is and our devotion and obedience to him. We would gladly mm-hmm. obey uh, what he has commanded and so on, right? Mm-hmm. So I would say, yeah, law is always there. If you want to say in terms of uh, revelation, knowledge, commands, uh, 
and law is a shorthand for for doing that. We do have to be careful with the word law mm -hmm. because it can be used in scripture in, in a variety of ways, right? So you can speak of law in terms of Mosaic law, often that's Mosaic covenant. Mm -hmm. So we have to sometimes distinguish, but we're using law here in terms of God's demand, mm -hmm. uh, his revelation of himself, what he uh, demands for, for people. Now with the breaking of a command, I mean, Adam as a representative of the human race, uh, all humans are still under that. Mm -hmm. I mean, so the, the, it's broken, right? But, but God's demands upon us, upon Adam, uh, and that's true of all of us. He represents all of us. God demands from every single person, whether they acknowledge it or not, uh, basic minimum, we would say, is to love the Lord your God mm -hmm. with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. That's true for every single person, no matter where they live, who they are. Uh, they would know that uh, tied to not only natural revelation, conscience, and so on. That, of course, is affected by sin but uh, also what they are in terms of being in Adam and, and so on. And that's written, I think, even on the heart. I mean, people have a sense of that, yet it's distorted, it's broken, it's rebelled against, uh, and so on. So I do think you have, so the brokenness of that creation covenant, we are now under condemnation. So that in Adam in scripture means that we are under the sentence of death, uh, we're not in covenant relationship in the sense of God is not our God in our sin. We stand under his judgment, but we are still his creatures that he demands from us uh, obedience, service, devotion. Right. Uh, we ought to give him this. And when we don't give him this, obviously there's uh, there's judgment that comes. So, so there's a lot here. One of the things that came up, I read repeatedly from Christians and, and heard from Christians um, during the lockdowns and stuff was you... You, they gave two reasons for why you can't um, place demands upon the state. One is that they're unbelievers, and so they don't believe in Jesus, so you can't throw a Bible verse at them. And to me, this is a category mistake. It, it, saying that they don't acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ doesn't mean the Lordship of Jesus Christ doesn't exist. And this goes back to exactly what you're saying in Genesis 1, that God has revealed himself as the Lord and King over all creation, mm whether or not that is accepted by all people. And Jeremy and I were talking about this. I mean, if you reject the universal lordship of Christ over all things, what is sin? Yeah, sin like, is lawlessness, what, what, right? what are you even calling people to repent of? Like, by what standard are they disobeying, if, if not according to God's word? And then the second thing they would say is, well, you need to keep the church and state separate. And and I'm a Baptist. I believe in the separation, the distinctiveness in roles and authority of the church and the state. I believe in that. But that's not to say that God and the state are separate, <laughs> right? It's like saying, I believe in the separation of husbands and elders. Yeah. It's, it's like, like they well, both have authority in different spheres and, and right, there's a relationship between yes. those two things, but... Yeah, so it's it's a failure to apply the the lordship of Jesus Christ over all of those things. And this this became a huge practical problem in at least the churches in Canada. And again, this goes back to your understanding of of even just at the beginning of Genesis 1. You know, what is Yeah, who, I mean they're they're I mean, you know, people that are responding like that uh, you know, are not working with a proper creator creature distinction, they're not no. working with who God is. They're not working with creation. They're not working with even the notion of natural revelation. They mm -hmm. somehow think that uh, you can only apply God's uh, commands and God only applies his commands um, and demands upon believers or something. Well, yeah. uh, let me tell you, on final judgment, mm -hmm. uh, God will hold people accountable and they mm -hmm. know, will know full well what they were responsible mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. um, written upon their very constitution as image bearers, conscience, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So the issue becomes... Not so much that uh, we do have a church state separation. We'd have to work that out in, in, in scripture. But even even in um, even in, in a Genesis three situation, a post fall situation, as I say, you know, ruling authorities or government would all be part of just simply how we would organize ourselves mm -hmm. in a, in a creation, you know, the fulfillment of the creation mandate. Even if no sin had occurred, mm -hmm. uh, yet in a post fall situation, you're going to have now still God's lordship over all people, mm -hmm. whether they acknowledge it or not. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you will have now either those who want to follow what he says versus those who don't. Mm -hmm. And then you then have to say, well, what demand is made upon those who don't? Mm -hmm. right? So we have the redemptive covenants. We have, um, you know, Noah is, is a believing man, Abraham and, and the nation of Israel, David and, and, and so on, all the way to the church. 
Yet even even when we have in the Old Testament, God holds nations accountable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, you know, and then then we have to say, well, what's he holding them accountable with? So this is a larger debate. Uh, you know, some would say, well, we go back to Israel's laws and then apply Israel to the state. I don't think that's correct. Um, but what we would apply to them is t- that which would be tied to creation order, mm-hmm. that which uh, is universal to all people. Mm-hmm. And what does that look like? Well, mm-hmm. when you step in creation, so think of the Ten Commandments that come later, the Decalogue that comes later. Um, you know, basically the Decalogue is love of God and neighbor, mm-hmm. right? So the first four are focused on our relationship to God. The last six are relationship to neighbor. Mm-hmm. And, and most of the areas there uh, in terms of, say, the last six, um, protection of human life, protection of the sexual relationship, protection of marriage, protection of family. That's all tied to creation order. Mm. And that is what exactly we hold our government according to. Mm-hmm. So that regardless of whether they believe or not, when Paul upholds in Romans 13, you know, says that they are agents of God, they're uphold, they're up to hold what is good. That's yeah. not just yeah. your, your mm-hmm. sense of what you think is good or what no. Canadians or Americans think is good. That's what God thinks is good. Yes. It's not upholding of, you, you know, don't sow two seeds in your field tied to the Mosaic Covenant, tied mm-hmm. to Israel, specific laws that are given to them for specific purposes and, and, and revelation and testing and a whole number of things. But it is tied to creation order. So minimally from creation, you have love of God and neighbor. Minimally from creation, you have the protection of human life mm-hmm. and all the ramifications mm-hmm. of that. So that goes back to the protection of the unborn, the protection of, of in a fallen world, those who have been affected by physical handicaps, mm-hmm. those all the way to ultimately the end of life. And then, of course, there'll be the outworking of that in terms of medical procedures mm-hmm. and so on. This move towards euthanasia and assisted suicide, you can just take your life. Government is immoral when they do that. Mm-hmm. They are violating the very demand of protection of human life. And even in the Noahic Covenant, which is a post-fall situation, to take one's life, your life should be forfeited. Yeah, yeah. There's the grounds for a proper role of government to, to institute the sword to uphold life, the protection of male and female. Our whole society, we, you know, we entered into, you know, the months of June, mm-hmm. uh, enter into, uh, you know, Pride Month type mm-hmm. of thing. This is that which will receive the judgment of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the male and females created. It's stamped upon us. You cannot change it, mm-hmm. right? Uh, people may be confused in, in terms of the fall, but the protection of sexuality, male and female, the protection of marriage, that one flesh relationship, the protection of children and family and the proper authority relations of children have to family, the protection of work. Right, tied to creation mandate. You start spelling these things out, and you've got a lot of government policy mm-hmm. that needs to be carried. Most of our government policy is to allow people to have a job, mm-hmm. to properly uh, protect human life, family, allow them to, you know, to, to to flourish and to live in society, to give freedoms, uh, and and so on. And this, of course, is what we're seeing in Canada and America being violated mm-hmm. yeah. at every, every single point. And this is what we can say the government is responsible for. And, of course, then we need to talk about the sphere of government. Yeah. Right? The government doesn't enter. It, it has limited. It's under, it's under the authority of God. It's limited in what it can do. And we should be arguing in a fallen world for limited government. You never, ever, ever want to give power in the in the hands of a few people mm-hmm. you want to spread that power out because we believe in human sin uh and 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 so on but there there is something there that is very very crucial so that when we say what law do they uphold minimally they are to uphold that which is tied to creation order we mm-hmm. see that reaffirmed in the noahic and the nations if you go to the non-christian nations the gentile nations in the old testament what does god hold them accountable for well, he goes to Sodom and Gomorrah and holds them accountable for how they treat humans and how they act sexually. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you go to Assyria and you go to Babylon and you go to Egypt and you go to these places, you, you begin to see what God you know, holds them accountable for. He doesn't hold them accountable for everything that you find in the Mosaic Covenant because that's given specifically to Israel. Mm-hmm. But he holds them accountable for what's tied to creation, who they are as image bearers, sanctity of human life, and all these other things uh, that that we've mm-hmm. mentioned. So when people say that, I mean, they are first of all denying that God is God. Yeah, and ruling over <laughs> there's <all> that. Things. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and 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 the, and they're denying the the reality of natural revelation. God is clearly. I mean, natural revelation isn't just you know the hunt for God. Mm-hmm. God has clearly made Himself known, and that we suppress it. But just because we suppress it, 
Just because we're non-Christians doesn't mean that God's demand isn't still upon that us. We're not and responsible. He will hold us accountable on Judgment Day. Yeah. So you mentioned a couple other things too. With the state, is that the state doesn't have authority to define what is good, to define what is right and wrong, because yeah. no human being possesses that authority. Yeah. And this is a Genesis one thing. This is a what is a human thing. But by definition, a creature cannot ultimately self-define. We can't define what is good, what is true. We can't define ourselves. And so what we see today is this total inversion of authority that rather than receive revelation from God and hear and obey, you know, who are we and what is our purpose? It's that I'm going to be, you know, the arbiter of truth and justice. The other thing is the state, it follows the state can't even determine what the role of the state is. No, like they don't have the authority to, because every yeah. <laughs> state wants to say like Caesar, my authority is absolute. Like yeah. that's what the state would love to say. Yeah. You don't get the job and then get to define your own job description. Yeah. Like you, you know, you took the job, here's the description. Yeah. You know, you don't get to just but change when, it. But <laughs> when we would say this is wrong, like in Canada, when I would say this is wrong, what the state is doing, many, if not most Christians would say, you may be right, but it's not your place to say, we right. just have to obey. Like, they're the government. It's like, but you're saying that they have the authority to determine what's wrong and right. And they have the authority to determine the limits, if any, to their authority, which they actually don't. And I like how you touched on the fact that this is implicit in Romans 13. Yeah. <laughs> Conveniently overlooked by many people. It's like, Paul was not advocating for tyranny. He was not advocating for totalitarianism. I'm saying if you're if you're doing good, you got nothing to fear, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was. Well, we have to realize. I mean, we in a fall, in a fallen world, right? I mean, human humans should acknowledge as creatures uh, the demands of God upon their life. What is good and right in terms of God? Yeah. Now, in terms of sin, they don't. No. And of course, that's that's exactly the problem. And and by. God's common grace and the effects of the gospel that come to nations, often there's a restraint Mm -hmm. that's put upon human depravity and rebellion Mm -hmm. so that uh, people don't always act as worse as they could Mm -hmm. and maybe even desire to, right? So there's a restraint that's put on. But it's a pretty sad situation when you get people, uh, when God gives people over to then ruling authorities that then just you know arbitrarily determine law and they think that they are God. Yeah. What you what you see in in human history, obviously, every everything post falls. You find tyranny. Yeah. I mean, this is this is why the uh, you know when when eventually you have you know Israel is to be a model nation of what it means to actually have humane relationships. Yes. Uh, these nations did not have humane relationships. Mm-hmm. Now they were still image bearers. Uh, they still, you know, could uh, be restrained and this type of thing. But sacrificing your children mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, the kind of Leviticus 18 descriptions mm-hmm. of what's going on in the land that Israel is not supposed to be doing mm-hmm. uh, sexually and this type of thing is telling you what kind of things that are going on. And we don't mm-hmm. have to, to list them. But, I mean, this is not humane. So, this is what happens when people, you know, move in their sin. Now, uh, it, you know, in the West, right, with the influence of, of the gospel and of Christianity, we've seen a restraint. Restraint. Yeah, uh, we've seen people that you know by God's common grace and the effects of even the church, uh, you know, salt and light effect that's tied to common grace upon the nation. We've had you know many humane laws, just laws, even even um, you know uh, systems of justice where there has to be two or three witnesses mm-hmm. built upon uh, scripture and then this type of thing. But when that gets pulled off, you always have totalitarianism. You mm-hmm. always have statism. When you have dictators and, and, and totalitarianism, you may get a benevolent dictator, but not often. Mm-hmm. And that's why even the founding of the United States, when they gave the declaration of independence, you got to read the preamble. You know, they say in, in, in human history, uh, there's not much in terms of countries that have actually had freedoms. Mm-hmm. We're going to try an experiment here that is eventually going to come out of some kind of Judeo-Christian uh, understanding that is going to give us freedom. So, so yes, I mean, we face in our, our situation a turning away from freedom turning away from liberty uh the 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 the, uh you know francis schaefer used to say that when you throw throw off the forms or the commands that uh, god gives even in terms of natural revelation uh, this doesn't produce freedom this produces uh, ultimately anarchy and Mm -hmm. tyranny right Mm -hmm. and that's what we're seeing and as christians we have to regardless of the government uh 
regardless of what you know Ottawa does or Toronto does or whoever in terms of our provincial governments or in the United States, what Washington DC does mm-hmm. or any uh, state government, we still have to hold them accountable mm-hmm. to the Lord to say, this is what's demanded of yes. you. Daniel does that with Nebuchadnezzar mm-hmm. and right. you, know, you have it with Darius and you have all these people um, uh, in the Old Testament. Now, the question is, is what do we hold them accountable to? And I, I do think it's tied to that which is uh, universal for all people, tied to creation order, natural revelation, and so on. And and you'll see some of that in the the biblical covenants mm-hmm. uh, spelled out, but then there's more specificity that's specifically given to um, to Israel as a covenant people mm-hmm. and and so on. There may be principles that we could draw uh, from there. For instance, the year of Jubilee, uh, you know, is given to Israel. You have to say, what's this given for? Well, it's revelatory of ultimately that which comes in Christ. You have mm-hmm. Luke 4 and so on that speaks of the year of Jubilee in, mm-hmm. in, in him. Yet it's also keeping a, a, a country out of perpetual debt. Right? Yeah. And so it, it tells you God values that he doesn't want uh, a, a poverty class, an underclass that is perpetually in debt, and he doesn't want overlords over them, mm-hmm. uh, which you have in most governments, right? You've never had such a thing as a middle class. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've had just simply rich and poor. He doesn't want that, mm-hmm. right? So, th- so then you would say, well, there's probably a principle that if we could ever uh, have a just government, that you'd probably want to make it so that uh, we don't have a perpetual underclass here. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that you give them un- endless welfare programs, because that goes against who they are as image bearers mm-hmm. uh, in, in terms of they need to work, and, and, and their whole dignity is found in work i mean you're mm-hmm. dehumanizing them when you when you uh, don't let them work uh in this type of thing so you have to work out those biblical truths but you know for people to think that government is independent of god mm-hmm. uh, they're not working with god in terms of the god of the bible right no. they're working with some some weak anemic notion of god god mm-hmm. is creator and lord he mm-hmm. is holding all people to account mm-hmm. uh, and even governments that are established are supposed to reflect some kind of just good rule mm-hmm. in a fallen world they often don't but we always call them back to it mm-hmm. and of course then we have to wrestle with when they do command us to do things that uh, are are forbidden and contrary to what is just and good then we rebel mm-hmm. so you would you would um you would say i mean you're basically saying that all people everywhere are accountable to god as their their creator and they are re- accountable to him and the revelation that he has given in and through creation. And, um, there, and, and that includes the state. Mm-hmm. And so this, this whole notion that just Christians are responsible to God and his word is just contrary to what the word actually says. It's a different God. Yeah. Um, and this is this is no small point, and this is why I wanted to start here because this is a this is not an obscure teaching in the Bible. No, this it, seems so patently obvious. It's it's a basic it's a basic category that God is a creator of all things. That His word, He did it by His word. It is authoritative. That we don't have the authority to define ourselves. He has that authority alone. We are all accountable to Him. We will bear the consequences of our failure to bear our responsibilities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are just these are just like th- this doesn't matter what camp you come from in yeah. orthodox Christianity. These are just Christianity 101 basic doctrines about the Christian worldview. It's really yeah. what we're talking about. And so what we've seen is that it, it's been revealed that a lot of Christians just and I don't mean this patronizingly but just actually don't have a Christian worldview. Yeah. Like they 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 know some things about the gospel that are true, but they haven't they have they don't have a whole Bible theology. They've got that secular, pluralistic, you know, idol in the corner, right? Right. And I think this this is what it boils down to for a lot of people is they don't want to have to defend the idea that they're shoving their religion down other people's throats. And it's right. like, well, uh, no, I'm not doing that. And it's like, well, <laughs> that's I mean, this yeah, well, is they, basic, they, right? Yeah, and they fail to realize that uh, every governing authority, every family unit, I mean, anything with authority is is, is going to work with a certain standard and certain ethical yeah. system, right? So so there is no, what they say, naked public square, mm-hmm, right? I mm-hmm. mean, uh, what we see on Pride Month type of thing is a moral value yeah. of the state, right? Yeah. And, and they are promoting that. Now, the question is, right, is whose values are correct? So mm-hmm. it's not as if I'm shoving my values down mm-hmm. on, on someone. 
no, we, we, you know, of course, then we have certain forms of government that allow us to, we should have free expression. We should mm-hmm. have vote. We try to argue our case in the public square. This is going to be good for the larger society. But this idea that somehow Christians should not bring uh, God's demand upon, um, you know, other pe- the government and other Christian, non-Christians and so on. No, we're arguing ultimately is that creation order and natural revelation and so on that people do know and they suppress is uh, that which is good for them. Now they may, they may reject that. They may go live contrary, yeah. but still it is that which is good. And we, and, and the most free countries have been those who have acted with a Judeo Christian uh, framework. So this is an important point because um, when God looked at the world that he created, he said that it was good. And when you, a lot of the response to Christian nationalism, and I know there's a lot of ways to define this, but let's just say the idea that nations are accountable to God and ought to be governed by his word. That's just a, that's just a true statement. What we mean when we say that is not that we are launching a Christian jihad. We mean that human, what like, or a consequence of this is the greatest potential for human flourishing. Right. Like, And if you don't actually believe that, if you doubt God's goodness, if you doubt that his norms and his word and his ways are actually good, then you will hear that and think this is bad. This is not good if the Christians get in charge of the public square. But what we're saying is according to to the Bible, if God's word were to be the standard of a nation, that is the best possible scenario for people in that nation on every level. And the irony is that as we reject this, we are, we are like catapulting ourselves into the most, it's not even just debauchery. It's actually just sadistic, torturous human carnage. Like we talk about mutilating kids here. We talk about yeah. giving two pills to people who don't know where their next rental unit is going to be. We're like, here, take a pill. It'll paralyze you. And the yeah. next one will kill you. Like we are, we are barbarians as we, as we have thrown off Christ, we have not become more just, more compassionate, more truthful. We have descended no. to the, to the lowest depths. I mean, we, we talk about child sacrifice. It's like, we are those people. Yeah. You know, we so just sanitize it. But I don't know if you saw that that uh, um, survey that was done in Canada recently, or maybe it was just in Ontario. It was like forty percent of people assisted or um, thought that we should expand our maid, our medical assistance in dying, uh, to include people who are experiencing homelessness. Yeah, like this, and forty yeah, percent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. forty percent of people think that the the solution to to it just kill them. At, to being an addict on the street is to kill them. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're the compassionate one, bud. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, well, this is, this yeah, is, this is where, when we we're, you know, when we try to think of applying these things to our society, we, we realize that uh, we've got huge, huge spiritual problem, right? So say in of the course. past where God's common grace is at work, uh, you know, people are willing to uh, accept the family and mm. embrace and rejoice and, mothers and fathers and children and we now have a situation where we hate our children yeah uh we're yeah. willing to uh you know cut off their organs mm-hmm. and that because of some notion of their identity and so on i mean we we've turned we have so i mean god has so given us over right mm-hmm. so we need to even have uh, a proper sense of what human flourishing is i mean we now have turned what is proper human flourishing, but that's viewed as, as, as wicked. Yes. And, uh, drag, drag queens are viewed as, uh, that which is, is holy and good and, and so on. Right. So our, our whole consciousness is seared. So at this point in time, right, we need more than anything else for the church to be the church for there to be true gospel proclamation, mm-hmm. regeneration mm-hmm. of people mm-hmm. and the effects of the gospel. Right. So you can speak of secondary tertiary effects, primary effects of the gospel would be a person's conversion, mm-hmm. but you also then have salt and light effects, right? Mm-hmm. So that, um, you know, somebody, you know, you work with a coworker and you treat them differently and they, they then treat you differently right? Mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. of how you treat them. And it has a spillover effect and by God's grace, it affects society, but we are in a very, very serious point where we're throwing all of that off so people are, are afraid of, of Christians you know we're going to establish a religion I would say well no 
Um, as, I don't think biblically and as Baptists we would say we're not interested in a federal establishment of religion, mm-hmm. but we are we are then are saying that there are moral standards yeah. that are ordained by God that are good for the society, and yes. that is what we would have to argue in the public square, mm-hmm. in ter- ter- particularly in terms of uh, our government, and, and and convince the majority of people to say, look, uh, we're going to. Um, endorse um, a marriage, heterosexual mm-hmm. marriage. We're not going to allow for homosexual marriage. Mm-hmm. We're not going to allow for the adoption of children to homosexual mm-hmm. uh, couples because that is that is wrong, right? Mm-hmm. So we're we're having to now on on their side of it, they they have standards too, and and their standards are wrong, and they are going to lead to distortion. But we have to realize that we have to argue for what is right and good. And I wonder whether many in the church actually think that God's standards are right and good. Well, this is the uh, elephant. That they actually in the room. lead to flourishing and so on. Yeah. Well, I think that's the elephant in the room. And I mean, part of that is you say is a product of conversion. Like to see God is good is you have to actually be converted. And that's part of the promise you talk about in is Ezekiel or Jeremiah that God would write his law in our hearts. Yeah. Well, what that means practically is that we see not only we see God. We, you know, as he's revealed to himself, it reveals himself in his word, but we see his norms and standards. We see what it means to love him and love our neighbor. And we believe that that is a good thing. Yeah. So when you don't have converted people, eventually you just let go of the whole thing. And yeah, the, the, the public, I forget what Truman says. He says the public the imagination or something like that, you know, the moral imagination of your culture is totally corrupted and inverted. Which is which is what we're seeing now. Hmm. Well, just think of just think of our Western society. You go back and just walk through, say, from the Reformation on. Uh, I mean, what was the Reformation? Well, it was a re- great recovery of the gospel, but it had it was a great it was revival too. Right. So that you know it wasn't perfect, mistakes were made and so on. But there was a, there was there was a revival effect yeah. that brought people into into salvation and then also secondary tertiary benefits. Then you think of um, the the uh, the Great Awakening, mm. uh, so that the French Revolution went one way, yeah. uh, but England was went a different way yeah. because mm-hmm. of the of the revivals. Mm-hmm. Uh, America would never even have been founded as a country mm-hmm. apart from the Great Awakening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right, the Great Awakening preceded ultimately the founding of the nation, and then even then every. Every you know, a couple of generations, there's always been at least in Canada and the United States some sense of revival. It sort of got sort of petered out as you went on. But I mean, you think of the Great Awakening. You think even in the 1800s of, of Finney. Now Finney was very poor in his theology, mm-hmm. but there was still a kind of moral effect mm. that came to the country. Even Billy Graham. Mm-hmm. Uh, Billy Graham always, you know, <laughs> some things he said. You think, oh boy, um, yeah. that may not have been good. But 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 on the other hand, I mean, he still had a huge effect on society there were yeah. still people that were converted there was a salt and a light effect that even was around the world we haven't seen anything like that for quite a while yeah and uh, and of course what what happens then in our sin unless god restrains it uh it it, it, it we have a license and of course uh, in history what happens unless there is revival and the church acts as the church and steps in and, and starts speaking up and trying to convince people that th- this way is what is right and good, and it's beneficial for them. What often, well, you know, what happens in history is is nations implode, mm-hmm. and uh, they eventually self destruct from within. And of course, that seems to be the direction we're going, apart from God's uh, intervening grace. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, I want to ask a question about the blessings and cursings, which I asked about law earlier. It seems like you're saying also that there's these the connection between blessings and cursings and covenant. Um, but like you're saying, I think a lot of people are scared to talk about the blessings of obedience. Um, to me, it just makes sense. Like, you know, the, don't be a glutton is going to lead to a healthier life. Mm-hmm. Like it's not works righteousness to obey God's law and, and, and expect good things to happen. Mm-hmm. Now, could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I think the blessing and curse obviously just comes from, you know, obedience to God is that which uh, he brings blessing for and, and mm-hmm. ultimately disobedience brings judgment and brings sorrow and heartache and not only in this life, but ultimately in eternity. But you also have, I think, a sense of, so you have to distinguish, I think, a blessing that comes from true believers, that they are 
born of the Spirit, uh, they're forgiven of their sins, they are obedient unto the Lord, and there's blessing that comes in relationship with the Lord, and they grow in grace and so on. We can also speak of blessings and, and curses, generally speaking, as well, right? So, I mean, many in the nation of Israel were not uh, regenerate people. They were a mixed community. You had believing, unbelieving people. Yet still, as there was a general sense that families were upheld, children were protected, uh, things went better for them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when people weren't getting divorced, uh, even if their marriages was a bit rocky, it, it certainly the kids survived and the kids did a lot better. There's a kind of blessing that comes that way. We've seen that even in our, our society. When you do things that are right, you uphold human life, you uphold mm -hmm. marriage, you uphold families and, and these kind of things. Um, you know, when I grew up in, uh, in, in Canada, I mean, I, I rarely heard of a divorce when I was right. in elementary school and high school and so on. And, and, and of course, uh, families were more stable, right? I mean, those families weren't perfect. There was problems. But now when you had all of the divorce and now all of the gay marriage and all that, it's not any better. It's not better. Yeah. It's, it's far worse, right? So as we, even if we have the sort of the sense of, of the um, you know obedience that's not you know Christian obedience that's not tied to regeneration. There can still be a kind of external uh, keeping of the forms that God has established that still brings benefit, mm -hmm. uh, and even societies, right? Societies that uh, protect the family, mm -hmm. protect marriage more than other societies will do better, right? They'll last longer. I mean, the whole study that was done in 1921 by J.D. Unwin, who looked at uh, all you know human history up up to that point in time, and argued that just simply heterosexual monogamy produced uh, what he called social energy in societies. Mm -hmm. That uh, if that was departed from, societies collapsed. Mm -hmm. right? Well, that didn't make them all believers and everything else. They may not even been doing it for the right reasons, mm -hmm. but they were still doing what God had created them to do. You cannot act as humans independent of God's word and what how God created us and expect that you're going to have normalcy. Mm -hmm. You're not. Mm -hmm. So and it's you're basically getting at the idea that there is a moral fabric to this world that is undeniable. Right. And that when you work with the moral fabric, things go well. When you go with the grain, things go better than if you go against the grain. And this is, I mean, this is the assumption that Proverbs is built on. Like wisdom literature in general is built on the fact that even, even you know, Jordan Peterson can look at the world and can observe, look, if we adopt these practices and postures, it's generally better for us than if we do these things. And he's totally right. It's not because he has received special revelation. It's because special revelation tells us that the world is a certain way. Mm. And and regardless of whether you believe that or accept that. Yeah. Um, and, and so, you know, yeah, we're seeing in this time, like God is not mocked. So when we reject his word and we abandon his way, we're just seeing the fruit of that. We're seeing the curse that comes upon, we're seeing the curse of sin coming to fruition for us who abandon God. Yeah, so, and then when you think of the curse, you think of the curse. You have to think of both the temporal effects uh, that can show up even in our lifetime, right? right, uh, right. The whole destruction um, of of you know people's whole psychology. Uh, mm. They're wanting to commit suicide, mm -hmm. uh, you know, kill themselves, and this type of thing. Uh, versus obviously eternal, and of course eternal is is more significant. But even in even in this life, to live independent of God, people can get along for a while, but not much. Yeah. Um, and, and eventually, even in this life, uh, it is miserable, right? Yeah. And of course, then, then you have the, 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 the effects of those same people are put in power and they want to then uh, you know, put in laws that will, in, will justify their actions and mm -hmm. uh, make them feel as if uh, they're legitimate. Of course, you have a, have a terrible situation then. Cool. So maybe one of the last things I want to touch on is um, has to do with the Lordship of Christ. I mean, we've obviously been talking about this, but more in particular because for us, I mean, for Jeremy and I and our churches, this was the kind of fundamental issue for us is, is who is Lord? And a lot of Christians overlook the, um, I mean, a lot of Christians would say, you know, Romans 13, just obey the state, do what they say kind of thing. And they overlook the, uh, the, the radical nature of the phrase Christ is Lord in Scripture, because how people in that era would have, they would have heard that before, and it was Caesar is Lord. And there's obviously, 
in Jesus' own day, you know, Sunshine talks about this, Glenn Sunshine, how people say, render to Caesar what's Caesar, but they forget the rest of the verse, right? Yeah. And, and to God, what's God's? And, and implicit in that is Jesus is placing a limit on Caesar's authority, that there are things that actually don't belong to Caesar. Mm-hmm. And so the the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord, the fact that the apostles said we should obey God rather than man when there is a conflict there. I mean, the the conflict between Christ and the rulers and the principalities and the authorities of the world has been going on in a sense since the beginning. And when he rose from the dead, he claimed authority over actual rulers. As the book of Revelation says, he is a ruler of the kings of the earth. And so, uh, maybe get you to, if someone was to come to you and describe the Lordship of Christ as being a purely private spiritual thing, right? Like someone was like, yes, I believe Christ is Lord. He's the Lord of my life and I obey him, but they don't and you can't expect them to. How would you respond to that theologically? Because that, happen, that happens a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, they, they have a very... Uh, poor Christology and they have a very mm-hmm. poor I mean tied to Christology doctrine of God again right mm-hmm. so so Christ is uh, not just uh, Lord of your spiritual life mm-hmm. or just of the Christian he is uh, the creator sustainer and reconciler of all things now reconcile of all things doesn't mean universalism but mm-hmm. ultimately he's the head of the new creation so you think mm-hmm. of a Colossians 1 15 through 20 he is the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation. But by him, all in him, all things have been created, uh, principalities, powers, and so on. He sustains all things, and he is also the head of the new creation. Mm-hmm. Well, that's lordship, uh-huh. right? So he's lord as creator. He's now lord uh, by virtue of his work. He's won the new creation, mm-hmm. and his resurrection, uh, ascension, he is now ruling as the king of kings and lord of lords. Now, I don't know. Uh, the, still the effects of dispensational theology has shown up where where sometimes you have this idea that, well, he's not really king until he comes back again. Yes. No, right. he's king now, yeah. seated on his throne. Now, this inter-advental age is now where the, the church takes the gospel to all nations, and the church will suffer. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. The church will see the great expansion of the gospel, and the mm-hmm. church will suffer, but they all do so under the lordship of King Jesus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Jesus says in terms of the Great Commission, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Yes. Now, that given uh, doesn't mean he didn't have it before, but it's uniquely tied to his work. So he mm-hmm. is Lord twice. Mm-hmm. He is Lord as the eternal Son of God, and he's now Lord by virtue of his assumption of our humanity, mm-hmm. his life, death, resurrection, ascension, and so on. So he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Read the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when you have the rulers of this world may look like they're ruling, the book of Revelation tells you the one who's on the throne is the triune God, um, you know, mediated through the Lordship of Christ mm-hmm. and and so on. So you have to tell mm-hmm. people, mm-hmm. right, that Christ is Lord. Now, what that means for them in terms of non-Christians is that they are to obey him as yes. creatures, as the ones he has made. Mm-hmm. Uh, he has not redeemed them. You want them to come to know him as Lord and Savior, mm-hmm. uh, but they still owe him everything as their yep. creator and Lord. Mm-hmm. And so that is has to be fully laid out. And even as, as Christians live their lives, you say, well, Christ is Lord of my life. Well, I'm at work and, uh, and now the company wants me to cheat. Yeah. Well, um, that now becomes a public affair, doesn't mm-hmm, it? Mm-hmm. Or it wants me to participate in something that is uh, contrary to God's word. Mm-hmm. Uh, it wants me to endorse, you know, the transgender day or something mm-hmm. like this. Well, eventually you have to say, well, who do I obey? Mm-hmm. And, and people seem to forget that uh, the early church, the early church only suffered right, because they obeyed Christ and <laughs> yeah. not Caesar. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, you know, it's you not because they said God is love. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, when they, you know, the people are converted at Ephesus. Well, what's Paul thrown into prison? Why? Yes. Because, because they see the burning of the books and the overturning of the witchcraft and everything else. The Christians are saying, "Well, we're just following Jesus." Yes, but also that's civil disobedience in yeah. terms of the state, right? I mean, mm-hmm. they were doing civil disobedience. They were throwing and overthrowing the guilds. We have to remember that all of the apostles except John. Uh, were martyred, mm-hmm. um, and Paul wasn't martyred uh, under Roman rule, right? Mm-hmm. And Peter, and so on. I mean, they they gave deference to Caesar, but mm-hmm. they also said no to Caesar, mm-hmm. 
repeatedly. They said no to the Jewish leaders. They said no to Rome. And they were willing to suffer under that government, even though they would appeal mm -hmm. to the government to bring justice and to do what was right and good. Mm -hmm. They still were willing to say, we will suffer for Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, when we have governments, in every government, we have to look at government. Romans 13 has to be applied in context. Mm -hmm. Paul speaking about the Roman government situation, mm -hmm. but not all governments. We don't live under a Roman empire mm -hmm. anymore. We live under a supposedly uh, democratic societies. In the United States, it's a constitutional republic and mm -hmm. so on, right? And the people are the ones that are supposed to vote and be responsible. So yeah. government's accountable to them. Yes. Right? So, so, I mean, we even have more uh, incentive to say, uh, rulers, uh, you've stepped out of your lane here. Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, this is not correct. Uh, this is not what you're to do. And, uh, and our recourse in our situation is to throw them out mm -hmm. and not put them back in power mm -hmm. uh, in this type of thing. And, and then even then, if you have a, a situation that we're facing both in Canada and the United States, that the government that even that gets elected, mm -hmm. uh, now 51% of the people uh, or morals are totally skewed mm -hmm. and they come against the church, then, uh, you know, we still uh, witness to the Lordship of Christ. We still call them to account. We still say, this is what you ought to do. Uh, and they may not follow it. And we then must be willing to uh, to suffer for Christ's sake. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So even the, the idea of the rule of law is is a Christian idea. You know, it's the idea that no human authority is absolute, that there's right. there's something above the king. Um, and we're going to get to that in future episodes, but th that's a great well, I mean, point. In some sense, all societies have had that, right? I yes. Mean, even, even pagan societies have some sense of their gods that are over. I mean, every society knows that you've got to have law over them. Now, of course, they can't work it out. Only, only uh, Christianity can consistently have you know, a proper standard of law, which yes. is God himself, not in some finite uh, being and, and, and this type of thing. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we, you know, the, the influence of Christianity has brought that sense of mm -hmm. lex rex, right? The mm -hmm. law is over the king and that's how our society is a function. Now, what we're seeing when you throw that off, of course, is the government becomes the law. Mm -hmm. uh, we have total lawlessness. This is what we have in the United States. We have a, a president that is uh, totally lawless. We have a, his son who is, uh, you know, should be in jail mm -hmm. and so on. But we don't have a just, we have a two-tiered justice system mm -hmm. now where people are not actually functioning in a, what used to be in our societies due to Christianity and the influence of Christianity, some sense of a proper sense of justice. Mm -hmm. We don't have that anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're seeing similar things up here. It's a pretty dire situation. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, I maybe mean, we wouldn't. But we, 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 wouldn't we, expect we, we fair have to treatment. vote, though, right? Yeah. yeah, we have to vote. The church has to get off her backside mm -hmm. and and start speaking up, mm -hmm. saying we we disagree. I mean, you don't have to be angry about it and so on, but we have to make our voice known. We have to, and when and when we become a minority, we don't have a voice anymore. Well, we still have to in the public square. Uh, you know, we have to preach the gospel, see people converted, and also you know, argue our case, right? Mm -hmm. and, and say, this is what's right and good mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so on. And, and there may be by God's common grace and reviving grace and so on that uh, you can win over people, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's what we're, our, our task is until Christ comes. We don't let the country go to uh, hell in a handbasket. Mm -hmm. We are here to be salt and light and to do what we can. Mm -hmm. uh, but first and foremost, right, our task is to live for Christ and mm -hmm. to, share the gospel, but that has, that has, that has public implications, not yeah. just private mm -hmm. implications. Yeah. Well, what, you're not allowed to be political up here. <laughs> <laughs> the irony is, the irony is I was saying to people during lockdowns, like we would, we were very public and we would get the criticism, you know, you should focus on the gospel, not politics. But I was like, who's the one being political? Yeah. Like you're the one doing everything the state tells you to do. I'm simply saying yeah. we should limit their authority and the, do what Jesus says. Who's the political one? The here? church. The churches that were taking public money to pay their pastors were accusing us of being of political. being political. Yeah, yeah. Well, the the, the the issue, as you well know, right, is is everyone is political. Yes. So this this idea, everyone has a worldview. Yeah. Everyone has a theology. Everyone has a moral system, right? It's, it, it, but of course, we have to argue which is the best mm -hmm. <laughs> political answer, which is the best moral system, which is the best worldview, theology, and so on. But this idea that while well, you're being political and, 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 and we're not type of thing, mm 
Uh, I mean, just just opens the door for people to just come in and push uh, in their own agenda. We say then nothing. And uh, the Lord doesn't want the church to simply be silent on these matters. The church has never been that. The church is not that in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Paul doesn't go on a campaign in that. But when he speaks to uh, political leaders, when John the Baptist speaks to Herod, of course, uh, John the Baptist pulls no punches. No. And he was the most, most righteous man before the kingdom yeah. of God. Yeah. Well, this was super helpful. I mean, yeah. um, obviously there's so many questions that we could ask at this point. Do you have anything else you want to add to that? No, I don't need to uh, open my mouth and show that I'm a <laughs> fool anymore. <laughs> well, that was, that was helpful. I mean, I hope people, when they listen to this, will walk away with the importance of recovering a whole Bible theology. And that begins in Genesis and recovering what it means that God is our creator, that he has made a covenant with us that we have broken, but he has made a promise to restore us and ultimately sending his son um, and, and making a new covenant with us in his blood. And we need to think through these matters rigorously, comprehensively, and uh, develop yeah. these, these basic categories. Because I think that's what we're missing. If we get these basic categories right, there's a lot we can disagree on, but we can move forward in a profitable way. Yeah. Definitely. So thanks so much for joining yes, us, thank uh, you. Dr. Wellen. We really yeah, it's appreciate been it. It's been great. Yep. Great to talk about these things. I mean, we, in some sense, you just scratched the surface, right? But these are so, so important matters. We live in very, very challenging times. Mm -hmm. What's needed is the church to be the church. We need faithful proclamation of God's word that not only touches the private sphere, but the public, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of Christians living out their uh, the truth of the gospel in their families, workplaces, society, and so on. But never losing the effect that the mission of the church is mm -hmm. to proclaim Christ. But that has implications for all of life. Mm -hmm, Christ right. is Lord of all of life. So we have to keep that before us. And uh, this privatized Christianity is not Christianity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, we to have that. to then take seriously what it means to be Christians, who God is, who Christ is. And uh, the church needs to be the church. Amen. Well, that's a great final word. We're going to let Scripture have the final word tonight. But uh, until next time, I'm going to leave all of our viewers with this from Psalm 2. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. We'll see you next time on the Dominion Podcast. Amen.